Thank you very much. And uh, Brenda, would you like to? Hi, my name is Brenda Twanita Pipestem, and I currently serve as the repatriation chair for the Board of Trustees here at the National Museum of the American Indian. I just want to, on behalf of the board and, and the committee, I just want to say thank you for joining us today to learn a little bit more about the work that we do here, the work that we feel as a committee and as the trustees is, our, is the most important work that we do. We serve as an advisory capacity to this wonderful institution, but beyond that, it is our sole statutory authority to govern repatriation. And in order to do that and how we do that, we establish the policies and procedures that the museum staff follow in order to help us identify the objects in our collections that are eligible for repatriation. We also work with tribes to help them financially to come in and review some of the objects that have been identified as being culturally associated to them. We are a true partnership here at the museum, the Board of Trustees and the repatriation staff. The Board of Trustees, we're currently made up of 18 of 23 our Native members our repatriation committee, we have six members who are all native currently on the board. And our repatriation staff, we have four researchers and three professional staff. One of our biggest challenges is that we are all very, we're still very frustrated by the fact that we do have human remains in our collection yet. We do not want our human remains of our ancestors to be in the possession of any museum, including our own. And to that, to that end, over the last 25 years, we have, um, the Board of Trustees, have actually been trying to develop the policies and procedures that inform the work that we do today. And some of the major policy decisions, you've heard about a couple of them, you've already heard about today, and that is the, the decision by the Board of Trustees to institute the reasonable man standard for repatriation. We've also, we also decided early on that instead of waiting for tribes to come to us to claim the items that we inventoried and distributed to the tribes back when the act was passed, that we would take a proactive, we would take proactive steps to do the research required to do the repatriation of human remains. And that for the first, up until 2000, so between 91 and 2000, the sole focus of our, of our committee and of the museum was on the repatriation of those human remains. Kevin talked a little bit about the fact that we deaccessioned human remains, but they weren't returned yet. We're still working on identifying who the appropriate parties are because one of the um, one of the challenges that we're running into is that just like today native peoples aren't just representative of one tribe there may be multiple tribal affiliations and then we have to work with tribes to determine who the appropriate party is to make those returns we've also um, in the year 2000, one of the things that we did, which has slowed down the repatriation of human remains, was that we decided as a board to be responsive to tribes who were coming to us and saying, we have other priorities right now. It's important that we have the return of human remains, but given the resources, given where we are, given the age of some of our elders, we need you the museum, you, the Board of Trustees, to accept our claims and to put them in, to accept our claims for objects that, uh, of cultural patrimony, to accept our claims for sacred objects that we need today in order to help us, in order to help us continue to be who we are as a people. And the Board made that decision 
And so there was a period of time where, with our limited staff, we were not doing any work on repatriating human, human remains. And the sole focus was on actual claims by tribes for sacred objects, objects of cultural patrimony, and unassociated funeral remains. And that's important work too. But, you know, in a perfect world, we wouldn't have to make the decision between those two larger categories, between our ancestors and our objects. But that's a reality of where we are, and that is one of the things that we continue to, that we continue to struggle with. 25 years after the passage of the act, no one who was involved at the beginning thought we would still have human remains in our collection, but we do. And we continue to work hard in order to remedy that fact. One of the things that Suzanne touched on earlier, and that was the, um, the fact that when they laid out the legislation, that they purposefully did not define what a sacred object was. And I think that is one of the important actions that the Board of Trustees continues to, to make, and that is we continue to refuse to define what a sacred object is. Now that creates a lot of confusion and a lot of um, angst, if you will, sometimes with our researchers. Because as a researcher, they like to have the parameters laid out. And we can't do that. So if we, as we continue going forward and as tribes continue to make claims for sacred objects or, or objects of cultural patrimony, we're going to continue going forward with shades of gray when it comes to working with our researchers. Um, in terms of, a, you know, the way this partnership works is that as a claim comes in or let me back up. We have four researchers, and of those four researchers, we have two that are working on repatriation claims of human remains. The other two focus solely on tribal claims of sacred objects, objects of cultural patrimony, as well as um, unaffiliated funerary objects. So we have parallel tracks in which the research is the same. It's just how those claims are initiated that are different. And um, the researchers... They do, their, they do their work, and then they write a report. And then those reports are sent up through the museum for a curatorial review. And then at that point, they come to us. They come to the board. And the committee, it is our responsibility to sit down and work individually with those researchers to parse and analyze the report and look at the evidence that they have found in working with either their, you know, either in books or with tribes and looking at tribal evidence and making sure that everything is given equal weight. And through this process, we as a board of trustees, we retain that decision-making authority because we don't necessarily always accept the research findings and the recommendations that may be made by our staff. We we send them back to the drawing board. We say, you know, you're, you're lacking, you may be lacking information, or we, um, we need further tribal consultation on these, on, you know, on this particular claim. And it's okay. It works. This partnership that we have with the staff of the museum is a, is a working partnership. It's not perfect, but it's something that, um, it is something that, I think the, when the legislation was created, I think that it is a framework that we have been able to successfully implement.
one of the other um, one of the other initiatives that we have been working on and that we've done tribal consultation on is the is the category of remains that are considered culturally unaffiliated. Right now we have um, we have a body we have I'm sorry for the <laughs> right now we have cult we have human remains that are culturally un unaffiliated and all we know as a board of trustees is that we have to take action on those action was taken in the early years in 1991 there was a reburial done but what we want to do now is we are in the process of we've done some tribal consultation and we need to establish procedures and protocols for the proper burial of tribal remains. If I can just follow up with a question about the culturally unaffiliated remains. Um, I, I know some have criticized, the NAGPRA regulations don't apply to the Smithsonian, but we often look to the NAGPRA regulations to guide us in areas where we ourselves haven't fully fleshed out policy. And, the, and there are those who've criticized, it took 20 plus years to get the uh, NAG regulations, and there are those who've criticized them by saying that um, in the, in the, to the extent that the regulations compel repatriation at some point of all human remains, that that could be contrary to the interests of Native people to the extent that in the haste to give them, to return the remains, there may be a lost opportunity to spend the time, consult with the tribes, and potentially figure out a cultural affiliation to return them to, an, to a specific tribe rather than to a general area or to a group of tribes. Um, I just wonder what, what your thoughts are on, on that and whether you, you think that, that that criticism is valid or unfounded. Well, it depends on the, it depends on, we have been very careful here at the museum and in our collection we have two different categories of unknown. We have those that are culturally that are literally culturally unknown. We have no records. We have no information in regard to where they come from, how they were obtained. There is, we don't have anything short of, you know, possible scientific testing. And that is not an area that we will ever, as far as I'm personally concerned, I hope that we never resort to. Um, we do not, um, so in regard to that particular narrow category, there isn't, they've been with us for 25 years, and over that course of 25 years, no new information has come to light. Now there are, we do have a category of culturally, uh, they're called culturally unassociated. No culture, I'm sorry, I forget what, yeah, they're culturally unassociated unknowns, which means that we don't know their specific, we don't know from which specific tribe that they come from, but we do have some information available that tells us that they may have come out of a specific mound or they may have come from a specific region in the United States. And we're not talking about reburying those remains at this point because we do have information still available and we are going to continue to do the research and to consult with tribes you know if we know that they that they are remains that came out of you know the southwest then our researchers and our professional staff they do and they have in the past and they will continue to consult with tribes who have historically come out of that region and then we will work with those tribes to help them identify among themselves who should take responsibility for those, for those remains. So um, in terms of 
are we doing a disservice by not continuing to hold them? No, I think the greater disservice, disservice when we don't have any information is to think that we have some right to them. They are, just because of human error in terms of not keeping adequate records, that doesn't mean that we need to keep them in our collection forever. They need to be properly returned to the earth. So I guess for better or worse, the repatriation process by law is a claims-driven process. And so it generally requires somebody to come forward and, and a claimant, and then they have to establish that the material that they're looking for fits a category that's eligible for repatriation. And then the person or tribe has to establish cultural affiliation. And, and so, um, and, to some, and at each step of that process, there's some evidence that needs to be provided in order for the board, um, in the case of NMAI, to satisfy its fiduciary obligation to these collections to make sure that it's giving back objects that it should be giving back under the, mm -hmm. under the act. So I guess in, the, in that respect, um, you know, if you were giving advice to a tribe that wanted to submit a claim and they had a sacred object, for example, that they wanted returned, but they didn't feel that they should have to establish that it was sacred, that they felt that they should just be able to say it is, um, how would you advise that tribe to, to submit their claim? What we would do is we would work with the tribe to, we have to first of all help the tribe and, well, help the we, we, it is our responsibility to help guide the tribe in putting together a claim. And what, what we ask them to do is to provide us with as much information as possible and that we are, we are willing to and, we, and routinely keep information that is pr private. Things that they, you know, we, we need as much information that the tribe is willing to share so that we can establish provenance for that, for that particular item and, and the use. And I know it's, you know, we heard from Suzanne earlier that it should always be, it's sacred because we say it is, but we, we do have a fiduciary responsibility over the items in our collection, and um, it is a, it will come down to a decision by the board to, you know, to analyze the information that the tribe is willing to share, and, you know, the, I, I really, I struggle with this to, to talk about it because we have claims for sacred objects, and it is a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, there are, no, there, are, there are no criteria. I can't say if you do X, Y, and Z, then you will be, get a favorable decision on your repatriation request. Um, it is, there really is, there really is no parameters beyond, beyond the undefined definition of sacred object in our policy. And what we have, um, what we have, what we have added to the actual de definition, so that there wouldn't be any, you know, confusion, is that under our policy, we say that our sacred objects are objects needed by traditional Native American religious leaders for the practice of Native American religions. <laughs> And that includes objects needed for the renewal of religious practice, because you hear, oftentimes you, you can hear the, um, the other side say, well, 
if it's not an ongoing religion, then it's not, um, if you don't need it for the practice of a, a current religion that is currently being practiced, then is it still a sacred object? Or is it an object of cultural patrimony? And we wanted to make sure that, you know, tribes have the ability to request their items that they belong that belong to them that they need to bring back a religious practice if that's what they choose to do and um, this this whole area of sacred objects is uh, is something that we struggle with we struggle with as a committee every time we get a claim 